All right, welcome to week five of our transcultural nursing course. This week, we're talking about health literacy and why it matters for patient safety. We're gonna talk about how to make sure that our patients have good health literacy, some barriers to health literacy, and why this matters. So as always, grab a pen and some paper, actively take notes, even ask some questions to yourselves in the margins of the notes. That's a way to actively engage um, in the content and remember it better. Let's go ahead and get into it. Now this lecture is starting off a little unusually in that there are two um, videos that I actually want you to watch before you watch me. So they are linked in the description box below. This first one is a TED Talk by Dr. Lisa Fitzpatrick. And the second one is um, also a TED Talk um, from Molly Hoddle. And so both of these are linked in the description box below. I'd love for you to go to these links now. Uh, you can click them and open them in a new tab and then come back and finish this lecture when you're done. So I hope at this point you have um, gone on and watched those two TED Talks kind of informing you about this topic more in general, but why health literacy is important and some of those challenges with health literacy. Um, let's go ahead and talk about what is health, patient health literacy. Patient health literacy is the patient's ability to obtain, read, and comprehend or understand health information. So when a patient gets a new diagnosis, a new medication, a new treatment, they need to be able to gather information about that topic, whether that's from us as nurses or maybe online from reliable sources. They need to be able to read it in a language that they understand and in a reading level that they understand. And they need to be able to actually understand that information and what it means to them. That's the general idea of what health literacy is. So why is health literacy so important? Health literacy is directly tied to patient outcomes. If patients, uh, patients have to be an active participation in their, in their care. And many of the treatments and medications and things we recommend happen when the patient is alone at home, not with us in the hospital or the clinic. And so patients need to be able to have the understanding um, and comprehension to be able to manage their care. In fact, non-adherence um, accounts for up to 50% of treatment failures, over 100,000 deaths, and up to 25% of hospitalizations each year in the United States. And so the greater the amount of health literacy, the better chance the patients are likely to adhere um, or follow the treatments or medications that have been prescribed. And adherence is usually um, dictated as 80%. If, if someone is doing 80% of their, their, of their treatment, it's considered pretty much optimal and it'll have the effect that we're looking for. However, uh, it is estimated that adherence to chronic medications, medications patients take for um, months to years for things like heart failure, asthma, um, diabetes, um, adherence to those chronic medications is only around 50%. And so there's a lot of healthcare dollars lost um, to non-adherence related to health literacy that could be brought back into the healthcare sitting, setting and help pay for more people and help provide care for more people. So if we can increase adherence, we're going to increase patient outcomes. And by doing so, we will have more money in the healthcare setting to care for more people. So we really want to make sure our patients have health literacy, that they can obtain, they can read, and they can understand medical information that they need for their care. The CDC has a plan for health literacy, um, and it's this national action plan to improve health literacy. I'm going to link the description of that below or the link to the the health literacy um, action plan. And it's a blueprint for national efforts to improve health literacy um, in all healthcare areas and identifies those underlying principles that everyone has the right to health information in order to make informed decisions and that health services should be understandable and beneficial to health, longevity, and quality of life. Um, the CDC Health Literacy Action Plan is aligned with Healthy People 2030, also linked below. Um, and that outlines specific goals that the government has in terms of increasing health literacy in our patient population. 
So there are guiding principles from the CDC about health equity um, in order to have inclusive communication that reaches all um, of our patient populations in a way that they can understand, that they can read, and then they can follow. So it avoids, avoids the use of adjectives such as vulnerable, marginalized, and high risk, um, which can be dehumanizing and um, condescending. It avoids dehumanizing language instead of using first person, people, or persons. And it is mindful that there are many types of subpopulations. So instead of using a broad term that can be difficult to define, like minority, it specifies the specific subpopulation they're talking about. It also use, avoids using words with violent connotations um, when referring to people, groups, and communities, and, uh, and avoid unintentional blaming. So these are just guiding principles in how health information should be written and delivered in a way that is inclusive. So to increase health literacy, a patient's ability to obtain, read, and understand um, treatment plans and, and medical information, we need to increase patient education. Patient education is goal-directed, meaning there's a specific goal we want to accomplish, whether it's taking insulin correctly or taking medications as prescribed. It's two-way communication. So it's us communicating to the patient and it's the patient communicating back to us. And nursing education, or sorry, patient education is actually part of the scope of nursing practice. It's written right into who we are as nurses. It's part of something we're responsible for. So there are three goals of patient education. We want to use patient education to improve health, restore health, and help patients learn to adapt to permanent disabilities or illnesses. So we want to increase health. Maybe we talk about drinking more water or taking walks or eating more vegetables. Those are ways to improve health. We can focus on restoring health. Maybe someone falls and breaks a hip and we teach them the different processes they need to get back to health at different parts of their healing process. And then sometimes things become chronic. Um, so maybe we need to teach a type one diabetic how to check their blood sugars for the first time if they've been newly diagnosed. Type one diabetes isn't gonna go away. It helps them learn to adapt to those permanent disabilities or illnesses. Now there are three domains of patient education. There's the cognitive domain, the effective domain, and the psychomotor domain. Cognitive means knowledge, just straight up things you need to know. Effective is changing attitudes or beliefs about a specific topic. And psychomotor is hands-on skills. So an example of this, uh, cognitive would be telling someone with hypothyroid that they need to take their levothyroxine uh, pill on an empty stomach first thing in the morning. There's no hands-on skill they need to learn. It's not a uh, belief that you need to change. It's just knowledge, just knowledge that they need. An effective change is changing attitudes or beliefs. So if you have someone who was recently diagnosed with type two diabetes and they believe that eating six slices of bread at lunch has no impact on their sugar or that having high sugar isn't really going to affect them in the short run or the long run. There's just no reason to comply. You present knowledge and information and resources to try to change their mind about the, their perception of the situation, helping them understand why it's important to comply with their treatment regime, why it's important to keep good glycemic control on their blood sugars. So trying to change those attitudes or beliefs, those heart, heart issues. And psychomotor is hands-on. So for that type one diabetic, for example, perhaps they have a continuous glucose monitor. And so they have to learn how to replace those on in their skin and set up the app on their phone, that hands-on skill, or even just giving themselves insulin the hands-on skill, some skill that they would need to use their hands and learn to do skillfully. Three domains of patient education. Now there's a couple of effectual learning variables, meaning um, beliefs and values that can get in the way of learning. One is motivation. So ask yourself, does your client even wanna make a change? Are they motivated to make this change? 
Um, and the second one is relevance. In other words, why is this change necessary? Let's go back to that type two diabetic, for example, newly diagnosed type two diabetic. Does your, does your client want to make a change? Are they interested in having better glycemic control? And do they need, do they see the reason for it? Let's say that they were drinking three Coca-Colas every day. Do they want to stop? Do they want to switch to water? And do they see that it's important to do so? If that patient loves their Coca-Cola and they don't understand or don't un see how it matters to their, their life, they may not care to learn that they should switch to water. So ask, your, ask yourself, is my client motivated and do they see the, the topic as relevant to them? Now let's talk about some learning accelerators. What's gonna help accelerate learning for our patients? Things that we can do to help their learning. Repetition. Repetition is something we all, benefits all of us. We don't get things usually the first time. Repetition helps lock new information into our brain. Having an undistracted envir environment, not a lot of alarms going off. If you've got a parent in the clinic and they've got two young toddlers running around the room and they're trying to, you know, parent them while you're talking, it may be really difficult for them to learn. Do they see it as relevant and motivating? Um, what's their baseline health literacy? If you're talking to someone who is a physician's assistant at an, in, in an ER as a job, um, they may have a very different health literacy than someone who is um, 17 and in high school or 35 and working construction. So what kind of is their baseline health literacy in general? Engaging the client. So are they engaged in the conversation? Do they feel um, interested in the conversation that you're having? Non-judgmental. If someone's feeling very judged for their behaviors or actions, um, they're not going to be interested in learning from us. And again, repetition. You get the idea? Repetition. See what I did there? Top and bottom. Yeah. Repetition is a good learning accelerator. So we can use all of these tools to help our patients learn. Let's talk about some learning disruptors. Um, there are a bunch of things that can get in the way of learning. Timing. If you want to go into your patient's room in the hospital at 3 a.m. and wake them up and talk to them about um, the insulin that they need to learn how to take, that's terrible timing. They're not going to learn very well. If your patient's very tired or in a lot of pain, if your patient has a lack of trust in you or in just healthcare in general, they're not going to want to learn from us. If the patient has fear about the topic, we need to help them overcome that before they're willing to learn about it. If there are cognitive deficits like memory loss, um, those can get in the way of learning. Does the patient have mental health issues, depression, schizophrenia, anxiety? Is there a lack of motivation or relevance? Is the environment distracting? Does the patient have any physical deficits that would limit their ability for those psychomotor skills, for example? And then cultural incompetence on behalf of the healthcare provider. I worked with a um, nurse at a community health setting that served pre predominantly the Latin community. And she had this lady who came in every week for type two diabetes and every week her glucose was high, her glucose was high. And she'd talk about, you know, only have two pieces of bread with your meal, you know, don't overdo it on the cereal, try to avoid potato chips. And finally it came around that she was having an entire pack of tortillas, 12 corn tortillas at every meal. Well, the nurse hadn't talked about tortillas and limiting those. She had only talked about limiting sandwich bread. And so it was a cultural incompetence on the behalf of the nurse, really not speaking the same language per se, in terms of what the patient's diet was. So we need to make sure we're aligning with um, things that are gonna help the patient learn. Uh, patient teaching methods. So there's ways that we can teach. The first is teach back. So we can um, explain something to my patient. So I can say, okay, so you're going to take your levothyroxine medication every day, first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. Now, patient, pretend that I'm the one you're teaching. Teach me about the levothyroxine and how you're supposed to take it. And by doing so, you can really hear if your patient understands. The second thing is hands-on demo. So if you are teaching a hands-on skill, you need the patient to do a hands-on demo. Insulin administration, um, uh, checking a glucose, using an asthma pump. These are all hands-on skills that you would need the patient to demo. 
And then finally, giving feedback. So when the patient does that skill or does the teach back, give them feedback on what they understood correctly and some areas that they might need to improve. And we love the nursing process in, nurse, in nursing. It gives us a systematic approach to any situation and nursing education is no different. So we need to make a teaching plan, assess their ability to learn, their readiness to learn and what they already know. Recognize the diagnosis, meaning the problem that you have. So maybe there is a lack of knowledge on how to administer insulin. There's a lack of knowledge on how to take a blood pressure. There's a lack of knowledge on the importance of doing daily weights. Then make a plan. What's the best way to teach the skill that's needed? Is it a hands-on demonstration? Is it a teach back? Then implement the plan, do the teaching and evaluate, did it work? So you're going to double check to make sure the patient really understood either through return demonstration or through teach back that the patient understood what the teaching was. And that's gonna do it for this week's uh, chat on patient literacy and the importance. Thank you so much for listening and um, I'll see you in class.